in the importance of the Lord's Supper and its relevance and significance for us today, maybe to a friend. So let me give you a little idea of what it might be like. I invited a friend of mine to participate in the Lord's Supper. It was the first time that uh, he had attended such a celebration. He was touched by the Seventh-day Adventists and how they celebrated this rite. He participated respectfully in silence. When the service came to an end, he responded with a long list of whys. Before entering the church, I had given my friend a, you know, kind of a crash course on the Lord's Supper, its significance, but despite all of this, he still questioned the logic and meaning behind these religious rituals. I know that we all understand, but yet I wanted to share with you what it might be like. It took quite a long time to explain the meaning of the foot washing, the breaking of the bread and the unleavened bread, and the grape juice and the blessing and the distribution of the symbols and so on. But with a, a Bible in hand, verse after verse, I tried to convey to him the value of a ceremony that originated, what, more than 2,000 years ago now. So I explained to him that at the first Lord's Supper, the foot washing rite was innovated, when you think about it, because it was a new and unusual experience for the disciples who were participating. But the real meaning of what they were experiencing was deep. It was very deep, actually. Touching on the most important theme found in the Bible, the sanctuary. If you, I don't know if you noticed, but most all of the songs that we sung today were talking about our relationship with Christ and how we need to keep ourselves in tune with him. Because that's what this is about. Our minds and our thoughts should be today especially in tune with him. My friend looked at me confused, looking for help while I was eager, eager to share my knowledge on this important Bible topic, I realized that he was still completely at loss to understand the deeper significance. So realizing this, I wanted to give him a glimpse into the meaning of the ceremonial rites of the sanctuary and promised him that we would cover that topic at another time. Again, we read the Bible passage from Luke 22, if you want to turn there. Luke 22, starting with verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. So they said to him, where do you want us to prepare? And he said to them, behold. When you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house wherein he enters. And then you shall say to the master of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And then he will show you a large furnished upper room there make ready. So they went and found it just as he had said to them. And they prepared, prepared the Passover. When the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. 
For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. When the disciples were in the room and everything was ready to start, Jesus did something very unusual, something that would be marked in each of the participants' minds forever. As long as they lived, anyway. In those days, it was customary for the host to either wash the guest's feet themselves or provide to have it done before everyone would take their place at the table. Well, no one did it. So Jesus took the opportunity to begin a rite that would be remembered throughout history. He washed his disciples' feet. And this is how John, the youngest disciple, explains it in his gospel. There should be perfect communion and a sense of humility and interpersonal acceptance among those who accept Jesus as their teacher and Lord. In the Christian church, nobody is superior. Nobody is a servant. And there is unity. Jesus was serious about this, and he added, if you understand these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Well, by this time, my friend was scratching his head. I realized that what was clear for me, because I grew up learning this custom, which I did, takes time takes time to be understood by someone who's new to the faith. But words like humility, communion, and unity, well, they all made sense to him. But he was confused to me that he found the foot washing process uh, process kind of embarrassing um, and tried tied to old traditions, like in faraway cultures. And so, Christians today may not always understand that. So he asked if there was any other way to illustrate unity, communion, and humility among Christians. And I was tempted to open, of course, (laughs) the bigger chapter of baptism and the link that exists between these two rites. However... I avoided making that same mistake that I made with the introduction of the sanctuary. Instead, uh, invited him to consider the invitation of Jesus. Do you remember that? If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you too ought to wash one another's feet. Now he started to ask questions about the food. You can imagine... The first questions, why unleavened bread, why grape juice, why only a little piece, why two prayers, and why living this celebration in such solemnity, similar to a mourning ceremony. And he had sensed the atmosphere as such, kind of shocked me, really, but he had. And he was right. Most of the time, that I attend a Lord's Supper, no one smiles, the music is austere, and all the participants seem to follow a strict protocol. And I don't plan to change that one iota. 
because it is a solemn thing. But I decided not to get into a discussion about all those aspects and instead spend our time answering his more direct questions. In a few words, I explained the reason for the unleavened bread, reading with him Matthew 26, 17, it says, on the first day of the feast of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? And this was a special time. If you remember when the Jews commemorated the Passover, the well-known liberation from Egypt called Exodus God gave clear instructions on how to prepare the feast. He was very explicit. And the Jews respected these instructions. Nothing fermented can be pre present in the home during the commemoration of the Passover. The leaven represents sin in a very simple and practical way. And this symbol invites God's people to refrain from sin. My friend was perplexed. I understood that in order to explain this concept better, I needed to present Jesus. Jesus. So we opened the Bible to read how Jesus introduced the concept of the bread and the wine. And that scene must have been really touching. When you think about it, all the disciples were eating. Jesus was looking around. He smiled, caught the attention of everyone. He prayed. His words must have sounded strange to their ears. Because he was blessing the bread, and after having broken it, he invited everybody to take a piece that was representing his body. And they ate it. So I could see the perplexity, a strange concept type of look on my friend. And so I explained the wonderful but seemingly cruel solution that God provided as an answer to the problem of sin. The death of his only son, Jesus. There is no alternative to being saved only to accept the sacrifice of Jesus. So the broken unleavened bread represents Jesus' death on the cross, his broken body. And the wine represents the blood of Jesus poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And so by drinking the wine, as well as eating the bread, we accept that sacrifice that Jesus made for us. We accept it. I realize that the list of whys rather than shortening was only getting longer, but why eat a piece of of bread and drink some grape juice to affirm having accepted Jesus as a personal savior. A simpler declaration of faith was not enough. It wasn't enough. Now it was me who was scratching my head, you know, to give him an exhaustive answer and at the same time wanting to leave space for his personal sense of faith because... It does take faith. So I jumped back to the Old Testament for a while just to show him that God had given instructions to kill a lamb and to eat its meat as a symbol of forgiveness of the committed sin. So do you see how that ties together? They killed the lamb and ate it, same as we today are to take the bread and the wine. But before allowing my friend to ask again about this cruelty, I hit him with the truth that the sin introduced by Satan is even crueler 
It's even crueler and even more if God had another solution to cope with the torture of sin. Don't you think he would have done it? I do. And then Jesus, with his death on the cross, gave in to the ceremony of killing the lamb. So now the eating of the bread and the drinking some wine is a symbol, is a representation of this substitutive death of Jesus. I know you know this, but because, my dear friend, we were supposed to be on that cross in view of the fact that we committed sin, we experienced the strongest and deepest sense of community at the Lord's table. So, the Lord's Supper is both a memorial and get this, a thanksgiving of the sealing of the everlasting covenant of grace. A memorial and a thanksgiving. The silence that followed, well, it kind of made me suspicious. I wondered um, what was going on, but other concepts were coming up, and I risked pushing my friend away from his personal contact with Jesus. Too many wives don't always encourage faith. There comes a point beyond which answers are not able to satisfy our thirst of knowledge and we have to leave God the benefit of the doubt sometimes as we even talked about in Sabbath school. There are things that we maybe just plain don't need to know and understand. He planned the blessed solution to overcome evil. God planned the best solution to overcome evil. But the silence was not loaded with doubts. It was a signal that something was changing in the heart of my friend. And a couple of tears confirmed my supposition. I realize that words are so inadequate to contain the immense concept of salvation. And they are. They are. It takes time to accept completely the meaning of the Lord's Supper. But I was confident. I was confident that the Holy Spirit would be able to do its part to help my friend understand. Isn't that what the Holy Spirit's for? Yes. Finally, I added something that sounded agreeable to him. It was a passage written by Paul. It gave a supplementary meaning to participating in the rite. He wrote, For every time you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We'll be sharing that again with you during our service. It's true. The Lord's Supper reminds us of the death of Jesus and the sacrifice he made. But, and this is huge, at the same time, it reminds us that Jesus will come again. Yeah. Christ's vow, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom, Matthew 26 and 29. It's prophetic. It directs our faith to a future future celebration of the communion meal with our Savior in the kingdom. What a meal that will be. The occasion is what? The great festival of the marriage supper of the Lamb, Revelation 
So Jesus gave hope to his disciples then and he gives hope to us today. The Lord's Supper is not a sterile, passive, and ritualistic tradition. Instead, it points, it points us toward the future. It brings to mind and to heart the sensitive willingness of Jesus to live with us forever. Can you imagine that? Living with Jesus forever. Why would he want to live with us forever? <laughs> because he created us to live forever. So it's to this supper that we look. This is the climactic expectation to which the Lord's Supper points us to. The joy of future glory through a personal fellowship with Christ in his everlasting kingdom. What a joy that will be. I'm aware, however, that I wasn't able to satisfy all the whys of my friend that he wanted answered, but I'm certain, I'm certain that something, something was working in his heart. Something that only with the help of Jesus could happen. And did it? Yes. It can for you and for me also. It may even be that we have a tear in our eye when we think about it the sacrifice that Christ has made and how much he wants to share that again with us anew in his kingdom. What an opportunity to renew our vows to him because he made a vow to us so we can renew our vow with him. As we partake now, separate and partake of the foot washing, And as we are serving one another, let's think about this great sacrifice that Christ made for each one of us. To have him wash our feet, the disciples, it never left them. They would remember that forever. So we need to remember it too that he also would be willing to wash our feet were he here today. So let's separate now, and then we'll come back here after that.